History happened everywhere. The verdict. This is our After Show podcast, where we look back at the most recent Euro 2024 special, episode 93, Hot in Scotland during 1976, versus Clothing in Poland during 2008. So if you haven't listened to that, go back and check it out, or else there will be spoilers ahead. <laughs> I've splashed it everywhere. Hello, my name is Ryan Weir and I'm here in the HHE studio with the golden goal to my penalty shootout, it's Mr. Peter Goddard. I'm radiant like gold, and also annoying like a golden goal. <laughs> yes, yeah, the one that's been banned. Yeah, because <laughs> it didn't really work. I see where you're coming from. <laughs> Whereas I'm just the nervous exhaustion of a penalty shootout. <laughs> And we are joined as ever by the dribbling defender of deflections. It's the judge himself. It's Mr. Paul Dursley. Oh, good evening. He's dribbling. <laughs> he really is dribbling. <laughs> good evening. Good evening, judge. <laughs> Now, Peter, I have spent the past week rolling around on the grass in agony, clutching my ankle and weeping like a baby. And as such, I've forgotten everything we talked about during the episode. So would you remind me what happened in, let's say, 60 seconds? Uh, it sounds like someone brushed against you gently and you took the footballing approach. But yes, I can do that. When would you like me to start? Well, I'd like you to do it. Now. In a thrilling exhibition of end-to-end -end podcasting, Ryan took us to Poland in Central Europe to talk about clothing in 2008. He introduced us to the Polish desert and the Polish national team, the Eagles, and their surprising superstar fan, as well as the player who may or may not be related to Hitler. He also told us about the team kit and the outrage produced when they dared to drop the beloved Eagle on the shirt. And in the second half, I took us to Scotland and its rich footballing history, playing the first international match and inventing the dugout. And I told you all about Paul Wilson, the Quality Street gang member who shrugged off the abuse of the terraces to earn his historic 15 minutes on the pitch representing his country. And if you didn't like that story, you're a proper Dundee United. Last week's episode done Summarised nicely Nice one, son Now we're over to a young Dursley Who's gonna tell you what he thought of me He'll take you apart without any care He's the lovely Paul Dursley The lovely Paul Dursley Ah, yes, I remember now. And what a pig bladder of an episode it was. <laughs> Filled with footy facts and soccer stats, I personally thought it was worthy of a trophy. But what does it matter what I think? Because we're here for the opinion of just one man, Judge Dursley. So, Paul, before we convene the court and receive your final ruling, why don't you kick us off with your first impressions of episode 93? Poland, nil. Scotland. Nil. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul, are you a football fan? Um, not really. What about the national team? Do you get behind the Lions? I suppose I did when I was younger, but as I've got older, I've got a lot more cynical. You? Cynical? You know, football isn't a sport anymore, it's a business. Basically, what is happening is sort of television companies are holding the supporters hostage and doing everything that they want to do. Um, you know, for example, this penalty shooter and all, all of that sort of stuff. That was only introduced for television. It's nothing to do with the sport. Um, but what's the point of having a football match if most, if most of them go to penalty shootouts? Just get rid of the football and have the penalty shootout. Well, I figure they start the game by flipping a coin. Why don't they end the game with flipping a coin? If it's nil-nil at the end or if it's a draw, just flip a coin. Heads, you're the winner, tails, you lose. Or just ah. do that right at the very start and don't even bother about the football. Well, it, exactly. The, there, there is a school of thought to say, well, why don't you have the penalty shootout either before the match or at half time? <laughs> so somebody has an advantage. So that a team is always behind. I've always thought a good rule would be the addition of an actual golden ball that gives you three goals if you get it in. Well, like a pinball machine. <laughs> Put some big bumpers on the pitch as well, flapping them out. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy with any new additions to the sport. Why not? <laughs> that was my cynical response. Obviously, I would like England to do well. However, I doubt it. 
Sorry, I, I, sorry, I need to chirp up. I'm a bit big, a bit curmudgeonly. That's your thing, isn't it? It's literally <laughs> your thing. <laughs> Who do you fall on the side of between Poland and Scotland? Oh, that's a difficult one. We have shafted Poland quite a lot in the last century, so perhaps we ought to give them the benefit of the doubt. So I feel like you're on my side then, Judge Dursley. Oh, I, I see you're Polish, aren't you? Yes. For this episode, I sure am. What about you, Peter? I would obviously prefer Scotland because A, I was Scotland and B, Scotland is nearer and I've been to Scotland more than I've been to Poland. Fair enough. Those are both rational reasons. So listen, Ryan, I want to get us started because you came last time disappointed as heck for not having found streaker stories. Yeah, like, I mean, clothing in Poland, that was the first thing that crossed my mind was naked people. So uh, the exact opposite of the thing. That is, the Ryan <laughs> way is to find the thing that isn't exactly at all what was asked for. But I want to satisfy you, Ryan, with streakers. So I brought some streakers to the verdict. Really? Yeah, not not <laughs> really. Exciting. No one's going to run through the studio, I'm afraid. Uh, is it Erica Rowe? Wasn't she the one at Twickenham in the 80s? You have nailed it, my friend, because Erica Rowe was a young lady who streaked at the rugby at Twickenham in 1982. She became quite a celebrity at the time because I guess it didn't happen that often. Mm. And she was a uh, athletic lady with great endowments, put it that way. And she ran across the pitch just for a laugh. And then she became something of a celebrity from it. Did she just do it the once? Yeah, she just did it once at Twickenham and uh, then that was it. She was basically famous. In the days before social media... That's quite impressive to become famous from that sort of thing. It really is, isn't it? And actually, what I discovered, Ryan, is that streaking is quite a recent phenomenon. I'm sure people have run naked many places, but in terms of sort of running into a major sporting event, the first recorded streaker, have a guess when it was? 1960s, during Peace and Love. 1974. Oh, OK. So there's a chap called Michael O'Brien, who was an Australian. Oh, was, it, is it, was he the helmet man? He was the helmet man. There's a very famous Sorry, photograph. <laughs> oh, that's... Sounds bad, doesn't it? But uh, if you know that there's a very famous photograph of a streaker kind of arms outstretched with a policeman covering his key points with his helmet, it became an incredibly famous picture. So, And this was this guy, Michael O'Brien, who was uh, at the England versus France rugby. Uh, he had a £10 bet that he would be able to run naked across the pitch. A lot of money then. Oh, well, it was a lot of money. So he runs across the pitch. A policeman catches him, a guy called Bruce Perry. And the guy, <laughs> in an interview later, he says... I caught him just before he got there. But when he explained the bet, I let him touch the stand before I cautioned him. So he basically right. helped the guy win his bet. <laughs> I wonder if they shared a little bit of that bet, Well, the winnings. Later on, Michael O'Brien, they have a, the TV show kind of brought him back some years later. He commented on the interview, I won the cash and I was fined the equivalent amount of cash from the magistrate the following Monday. So, <laughs> so all squared, he says. <laughs> But so he was the first one, the first recorded major item. We got Erica Rowe, who's the one I remember because 1982, I was an 11 year old boy and I had a funny feeling in my tummy. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the king of streakers, that's apparently undisputed, is a guy called Mark Roberts, who is an Englishman who has streaked across the world at over 500 different events in more than 20 different countries. Wow, that's a lot of streaking. He's very committed to it. Surely he's banned from most stadiums, though. It's not like they don't have a good picture of him. <laughs> <laughs> what he looks like. Indeed. At one point, he claimed he was required to surrender his passport whenever an England football team played abroad. <laughs> <laughs> But he doesn't. He doesn't just stick to sporting events either. He streaked apparently Mr. Universe, which seems like a terrible place to streak, if you ask me. Uh, yeah, muscly men, and then you come padding through in all your pasty crumbliness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's done Miss World, which seems a little bit dodgy. The, the Olympics games, tennis matches, but rather courageously, he streaked at the running of the bulls. Oh my goodness! <laughs> wow. Okay. But the one I found most impressive, I don't know why I found it impressive, is he managed to streak at the synchronized swimming world championships. <laughs> Wait, did he just dive in the water? I don't know how. I don't know how he got... It's, you know, it's a quite a secure area, isn't it? It's not like you could just jump on the pitch. And you're also not allowed to run around a swimming pool. In, yeah, no running, yeah. <laughs> no, no running, no petting. No heavy petting, always a problem. Yeah. No bombing. <laughs> no bombing. <Yeah. laughs> 
<laughs> he became so well known he was actually featured in an advert for Atletico Bilbao in which the concept of the advert is there's a naked football game going on and he runs across fully clothed. Ah, that's quite clever. <laughs> It's funny, streaking seems to have sort of disappeared. You don't hear about it as much as you once did. Yeah, just recently there was one chap who ran onto the pitch and did a backflip and got tased by the security guards, I saw. (laughs) My God, tased! But for me, the nudity, there's something about the kind of a vulnerability of doing it naked that makes them much more endearing streakers rather than just show offs who run onto a pitch and jump around the place. It seems so innocent, doesn't it? It does weirdly. I just, I, 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 a little, I just thought of something. You, you may wish to insert it at the appropriate point. <laughs> 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 okay <laughs> but of course the original originally the, the original streakers were the athletes themselves ah like the ancient greeks used to wrestle naked and run marathons naked didn't they yes uh, it was uh, it was clothes were considered uh, an encumbrance uh, and so it, it was done naked that's how i feel in my zoom meetings I would have thought things flopping around would be more of an encumbrance. In a wrestling match, it seems certainly uh, a leverage point you wouldn't want to take an advantage of, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, don't, don't athletes regularly shit themselves when they're running a marathon? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so during the episode, guys, I told you some facts about the uh, footballing legend Robert Lewandowski. Ah, yes. Some facts and uh, some things that we claimed may not indeed have been facts. Yes, true. I told you about the rumours that had circulated online that he was, in fact, related to Adolf Hitler via his sister, Paula Hitler. I still chuckle at Paula Hitler. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why either. <laughs> well, he had he had a, a quite a number of half siblings. I think he did have some full siblings, but they all died. Yeah, in fact, Paula was the only remaining full sibling. Oh, wasn't she? Wasn't she a half? I thought she was a half sister. No, no, not at all. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about Paula. Anyway, born in Austria Hungary, eighteen ninety six, to Alois Hitler and his third wife Clara Poltz. Paula was the Hitler family's sixth and final child, so she was the youngest. And we don't really know much about her early life, uh, other than it was kind of pretty much filled with grief. Four of the five siblings that she had died during infancy. Her father died when she was six years old. Her mother died when she was 11. And that basically just left her under the guardianship of Adolf. I can't think of a better guardian myself. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know who Stuart Houston is or was? No idea. He was christened William Patrick Hitler and he was a half-nephew of Adolf Hitler. So his father was Alois Jr., mm-hmm. who was Hitler's father's first son, who was at the time a hotel waiter in Dublin. He married an Irish girl. They moved to Liverpool. And in 1911, William Patrick Hitler was born. The odd thing about William Patrick Hitler was that he moved to America during the war and he joined the US Navy. So there was actually a Hitler fighting Hitler in the Second World War. And funny enough, it was only after the war that he changed his name to Stuart Houston. My goodness. Well, there you go. Well, Hitler's original name was Hedler, H-I-E-L-D-E-R. But let's talk about Paula for a second. Um, so Paula was sent to live in a convent, but she left early and moved to Vienna, where as a young woman, she was hired as a housekeeper. Um, she struggled, though, financially. So she got a couple of other jobs. She worked as a secretary and as a shop assistant. And for the most part, during this time, she lost contact with Adolf. He was busy struggling to make it as an artist, apparently. And then, of course, later fighting in World War One. They did reconnect, though, during 1920s and 1930s. This was during his rise to power. And while they were never really close, her brother did make sure that she received regular financial support, especially when she was fired from her job because her employers found out who she was related to. (laughs) She got cancelled. Wow. Now, during the war, she worked as a secretary at a 
military field hospital in Vienna. And in the final days of the war, aged 49, on her brother's orders, she one day got a knock on the door. She was collected by two SS men, driven to his summer house, where she was given 100,000 marks and then told to return home with it. That is not the outcome most people who get a knock on the door with two SS soldiers experienced, is it? Certainly not, no. She's like, I don't know why people are so scared of this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, after the war, she was arrested by the Americans. She was interrogated for several months, but was released when she convinced them that she had some affection for her brother, but that ultimately she'd had no involvement in the Nazi party or any of its crimes, and was in fact shocked and in disbelief at the atrocities that he and his followers had committed. Yeah, it's not fair, is it, to be just related to someone is not to be involved in their crimes, is it? No, that's true. Uh, that being said, as shocked as she was, she still used those 100 100,000 marks that uh, she had been given to move into a small apartment in Bavaria in Germany. And she lived there under the name of Paula Wolf, doing her best to sort of stay out of the public eye and not talk about her brother or the Nazis. In fact, she only gave one recorded interview. It was in 1959 and it was for a British TV documentary called Tyranny, the Years of Adolf Hitler. And whilst the recording has kind of been lost to time, there is a small section of audio that has been saved. And I'll play a little bit for you. You here, this is Paula Wolf or Paula Hitler. Als mein Bruder Adam ungefähr zwei Jahre alt war, ist er einmal auf eine Leiter hinaufgestiegen bis zur obersten Sprosse. Mein, und die Mutter hat gehört, dass When my brother Adolf was about two years old, he once climbed up a ladder to the top rung. Mother heard that he was up there on the ladder and was frightened to death. When we children played Red Indians, my brother Adolf was always the leader. All the others did what he told them. They must have had an instinct that his will was stronger than theirs. So there you go. Born leader. Born leader, exactly. Yes. Alarming. She died a year later after that interview, 1st of June 1960. She was buried in a cemetery in Bavaria under the name of Paula Hitler. As far as we know, she was never married and she didn't have any children. So that does tend to sort of point to the fact that Robert Lewandowski's grandmother rumour is just simply that, a rumour with no basis in fact. In, in fact, Lewandowski's family history has been well documented. It all seems to point to a family that lived in Poland and there is no historical evidence or any credible sources that link him to Paula Hitler or indeed Adolf Hitler. But there you go, Paula Hitler. Yeah, I understand Paula the Ripper had the similar problems in life. <laughs> Adolf has very much done for both the names Adolf and Hitler, though, hasn't he? That's why, I think that's why the name Paula Hitler made me laugh so much. It's like the ordinariness, like Doreen Hitler. It's got like, <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's that ordinariness combined with this hit, the watchword for monstrosity. The, the most amazing thing was that she had that tiny little moustache as well, so I guess that <laughs> ran in the family. <laughs> <laughs> and she only had one ball. <laughs> <laughs> one each, that's fair enough. Yeah. On average, they were fine. <laughs> well, that's not going in. So, Ryan, we were talking about clothing. I know you wanted to talk about not clothing, but you ended up talking about clothing. So I thought I'd find some interesting kit facts for you to bring to the verdict that maybe fell outside the time period in the country. Kit facts! There's kit fact news, actually, because I was kind of looking for interesting, scandalous type stuff. So this year, apparently, Adidas has banned German football fans from using the number 44 on their German replica team jerseys because the four looks very much like the S of SS. And so... <laughs> Now they've suddenly realised they may have made a bit of a gaffe here, so they've actually banned the number 44. Wow. Uh, and this will shock you to learn that some French fans are unhappy with their big cock. I beg your pardon? <laughs> <laughs> The new French strip by Nike has increased the size of the traditional cockerel emblem to uh, quite a substantial degree, I must say, to the chagrin of some of the fans, uh, but the delight of, obviously, headline writers everywhere. So they're going to make it a little cock in the future? They, I suspect they will change. It will grow and shrink <laughs> according to the weather. 
<laughs> but this got me looking at kit scandals. So did you know that Cameroon have had two different jerseys banned for their design? Wow, no, I had no idea. So the first one was after 2002, that the Africa Cup of Nations, they won the competition and they were going to go into the World Cup later that year. They were wearing a sleeveless shirt. So you know Aussie rules football, they have that kind of vest look. The yeah. Cameroon team had one of those with no sleeves. We talked about this off air, actually, Pete, and that was one of my suggestions is if you want to make a shirt lighter and more breathable, just cut the arms off it. Well, yes, but FIFA will not have it. So when they came to the World Cup, they said no vests allowed and they had to stitch little black sleeves onto it and they were never allowed to wear the top again. But then they get a few years later, two years later, in fact, they get another ban, Puma and Cameroon strike again for the 2004 Africa Cup of Nations again. Cameroon wore a, it looks like a normal kit, but actually it was a one piece kit. So the shirt and the shorts were attached to each other. Like a little jumpsuit. It is like a tiny jumpsuit, but FIFA again <laughs> banned the shirt. <laughs> yeah. What do you call that? A short a, shirt? I don't know. Shorts? <laughs> shorts is taken, I believe. I'm wearing my the shorts. 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 Uh, you wouldn't want to be given a wedgie in one of those. No, no. Certainly, <laughs> nor would you want to be caught short, to be honest with you. It did not look like an easy exit ensemble. Actually, FIFA tried to find them and deduct six points for this kit, but uh, Puma opened a lawsuit against FIFA and they had to drop the case. Yeah, that seems a bit harsh, doesn't it? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, just tell them not to wear it seems, you know, a big, a big enough of a hassle to have to go and find another kit. Well, exactly. And on that note, I also found a couple of uh, kit cock-ups that were quite interesting. Uh, in 1978, when France were playing Hungary in the group stage, FIFA wrote to the teams and said, Hungary, can you wear your red and France, can you wear your white kit? Now, for some reason, FIFA changed their mind and they wrote to the both guys again and they say, France, can you play in blue? And Hungary, can you play in white? But the French never got their letter. So now they both think they're wearing white, right? So the French rock up <laughs> with their white kit, as do Hungary. They, they don't even notice until both teams are warming up on the pitch. They go, oh, hang on, this is, isn't right. So it turns out they have to send local officials out to find some kit. And they borrowed some kit from a local team called Kimberley Atletico Club. And they had green and white striped kit that was lent to the French national team to wear for this game. But it wasn't the only time it's happened either. So even in the UK, we've seen the same thing in 1999. Chelsea travelled to Coventry City. They forgot their kit. So they ended up borrowing Coventry City's own away kit for the game, which has got to be pretty confusing for Coventry going, well, everyone looks like they're on my side now. (laughs) (laughs) But it didn't stop them. Coventry won the game 3-1 in the end. I mean, when I was a kid, you'd have two teams. One would be skins and one would be shirts. So, you know, why don't they just do that? Surely Chelsea were supposed to play the game in their pants. <laughs> Playing a game in their pants? I don't think that'd be allowed. Ew. There is, of course, an animal flink there, isn't there? Uh, how? Keen football player? No, um, Adidas. Adolf Dassler. Ah. Ah, right. There is an Adolf Link. You're right. I'm sure Poland's really happy about us talking about the Nazi <laughs> party so much during our episodes. Oh, dear. So, guys, during the episode, I played a part of the Polish national anthem, which, if you remember, was called Poland is Not Yet Lost. Yet. <laughs> yes, as you pointed out, Fee, it was rather pessimistic, wasn't it? <laughs> well, you weren't the only one who noticed that. We had one listener writing to tell us that in 1998, Scotland's official World Cup song was equally pessimistic. Apparently the song was uh, written and sung by Della Mitri and was called Don't Come Home Too Soon. <laughs> but we do understand you're coming home <laughs> yeah and i guess uh, having looked into it i also noticed that ireland's official song for euro 2012 was called the rocky road to poland <laughs> <laughs> Uh, But talking of songs, there have been some unfortunate mix-ups over the years too with the national anthems. In the 2016 Copa America, Uruguay stood for their national anthem, but someone at the stadium accidentally played the national anthem for Chile (laughs) instead. (laughs) Uh, In the early 2000s, a guy was hired to sing the national anthem before a game between Mexico and the United States, and he just plain forgot the lyrics. So he stood there in front of the crowd and just made up lyrics instead. (laughs) 
In 2014, in a game against Slovakia, the stadium accidentally played numb by Linkin Park instead of their <laughs> national anthem. That is radical shift. <laughs> Not football, but in 1977, a driver at the Grand Prix stood on the winner's podium there to the sounds of happy birthday because the band didn't know the Australian national anthem. <laughs> 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 of course, happy happy birthday was not originally a song for your birthday, was it? Uh, was it not? It was a national anthem <laughs> <laughs> for Australia. No, it, it's the original. The lyrics were "Good morning," and so it was "Good morning to you, good morning to you, good morning, good morning, good morning to you." It was supposed to be said every morning, and of course, it's tedious enough once a year, but once a day. <laughs> Yeah, people soon tired of that. Thought, how do we reduce our exposure to this garbage? And I call it a birthday song. I'm in. <laughs> Done. Yeah. Uh, the Kazakhstan national anthem has been played a number of times at several events, but unfortunately, they've all played the anthem from the comedy film Borat. In <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> yes. Uh, although in 2012 at a ski festival in Kostane, uh, instead of the Kazakhstan anthem, they played Livin' La Vida Loca by Ricky Martin instead. <laughs> I say Kazakhstan should have jumped on that, yeah. adopted it as their national anthem, and said no harm, no foul. Exactly. But my absolute favourite butchering of national anthems is reserved for the Egyptian Army Orchestra. I'm going to play some for you now. The Egyptian Army Orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, gentlemen, well, this is it. We have come to the end of the line. It's time for us both to step into the dock, Peter, and prepare to face the people's judge. I mean... Judge Dursley, are you ready to give your verdict? Yes, I am. Then will the defendants please rise? Your Honour, as usual, may we start proceedings by first asking for your verdict on factual content. (sighs) Oh, dear. That was really... Scant facts, I'm afraid, this time. Who was interested in kit choices over the last N years? <laughs> uh, I can't even remember the Scottish stuff. What? <laughs> there, there were a few a few facts um, in there, but I, I still hold that it was a bit scant and a bit, a bit niche, I feel. Well, then, may I ask for your verdict on factual content? For factual content, I should give you a D. We must be the only show in the world that can do a football episode and be accused of having overly niche content. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Your Honour, then may we have your verdict on entertainment value? Well, I think I probably found it more interesting than a game of football. And shorter. Much shorter, yes. I, I, I found it moderately entertaining. I will give you a... an enjoyable B-. B minus is good, B. I'm happy with that. Okay, Your Honour, then may we have your verdict on Dursley Factor. Mysterious. Knowable. Enigmatic. Well, I'm afraid I think you missed a trick. I think you should have done it like a game of football where you had a bit of this and then you passed it on to the other one and then you passed it back and you you, oh. you, you, you had you had all of that. that. That would have made it more flowing rather than a game of two halves. I'm taking notes for the World Cup, Ryan. Yes, please do, Pete. Oh, God. Well, then, may we have your grade for Dursley Factor? So, I'm going to be relatively neutral on this one, and I shall give you... C+. Nice. Not bad. So, we have reached the final verdict. But before the judge passes his ruling, we have an opportunity to enter a plea. So, if we choose to do so, we should make that plea now. I'd just like to say it's a game of two halves. I'm just happy to be here. I've enjoyed the game. I look forward to the next game. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Your Honour, the defendants stand before you. Have you reached a verdict? 
Yes, I think I have. Okay, well in that case, I would ask most respectfully for your ruling. This is this is a bit of a tough one because I know football is an incredibly popular sport, second only to angling, I believe. But on reflection, I'm afraid I can only give you C. Well, I'm okay with that, Pete. I don't, I don't, know about I don't you. mind that at all. I'm okay oh, also. Okay. That feels like a draw. It does. A no score draw. A no score <laughs> draw, which was promised at the start. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, look, there you go. That is the show for this week. If you'd like to get in touch about any of the things that we've talked about on the show or just to say hello, you can reach out to us on social media through our website at hhepodcast.com or by email at Pete and Ryan at hhepodcast.com. And of course, we'd love to hear from you. And you never know, you might end up featured on a future show. That's right. And one way to definitely feature on a future episode is to rate and review the show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or even Good Pods if you're Keb. This one was five-star approved. Thanks, Keb. Also, if you're on Mastodon, Facebook, Instagram or X, you can find us at HHE Podcast. And if you subscribe there, you get an alert when we post trivia tidbits, pictures, news, anything we can think of, really, to add to your experience. That's right. And we're going to be back again very soon with our next episode, episode 94, Magic in Burundi during World War II. Ooh. But in the meantime, a huge thank you to the judge himself. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. I like it when you thank me after I give you a bad grade. <laughs> <laughs> and that is it. I guess all that's left to say is... He's running out the wing. It's a cross in. He shoots. He scores! So, I wanted to talk a bit more about that desert because you said, oh, there's a desert in Poland and it was in the orientation and fact area, so obviously you didn't delve into it. Yeah, I skipped over that pretty quickly, but it was surprising to me when I found that. I was left hungry for more, so I went foraging, Ryan. Tell me more about the Bledow Desert. So, the sand is believed to have been deposited there hundreds, thousands of years ago by glaciers, but it wasn't a desert all the time. It became desertified because during the 13th century and onwards, the forest that was there was felled. Then once it was sandy and dry, nothing oh, was then growing see. back. Partially man-made desert. Yeah, wow. exactly. It was kind of primed for desertness, but we kind of pushed it over the edge. Apparently in World War II, it was used by German troops to practice before going to Africa, which is not a massive space. <laughs> I can only imagine all these guys cramped in practicing <laughs> desert warfare in a few square kilometres. And interestingly, uh, it, just as it grew, it can also shrink. The forest started encroaching on the desert. And in a weird reversal of what you'd usually expect, in 2013, a movement started to keep the trees at bay and preserve the desert. Oh, wow. OK. So, so no one's tried to sort of develop it and build onto it. No, it's exactly the opposite. Everyone's like, keep the forest away, maintain the desert, because I guess it's a quirky, unusual thing. It's a bit of a tourist attraction. Mm. But now there's a weird, can you call it conservation efforts? Is it ecology? It, it raises all sorts of interesting mm. questions about you know, what do we preserve and what do we not preserve? But it's certainly very unusual to have a desert and say, we want more of that or at least keep that where it is. Well, no, no, sell, sell it to Dubai. They could build a ski slope there. <laughs> they could. That's true. I want to go to the Bledow Desert. Yeah, me too. Briefly. <laughs> Briefly. <laughs> for about an hour. <laughs> You'd have to walk in pretty tight circles to be lost for any significant length of time, wouldn't you? You said that in the episode. I did, yeah. Scrap that. Don't put that in. What are you eating anyway? And why are you eating during the verdict? I'm starving. So unprofessional. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, lovely YouTube folks. This is a special message just for you. Yeah, thanks for listening all the way to the end. Now, if you enjoyed the show, please let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And don't forget to take a moment to hit that like and smash subscribe. Hit that like? Yeah. Smash subscribe? Yeah, it's what people say. Do they, though? Yeah. Only the cool kids. And you think you're the cool kids, do you? No, we're the cool kids. Oh, yeah, I suppose we are. All right, smash that like button, people. Smash it real good. Oh, yeah. Nice.